Over the years, I've done a few responses to this guy who used to be my pastor. And while we've heard him say some pretty manipulative and horrific things, nothing to this point had prepared me for the sermon we're about to see today in which, two days before the last presidential election, he plainly tells his congregation who to vote for, without mentioning names because I guess that's where you've crossed a line, and states that all of politics today is a battle between good and evil. He advocates for what amounts to theocracy and takes petty political jabs while openly yearning for the good old days when only Christians could hold public office. But that's getting ahead of myself, which is going to be easy to do, because this is one of those rare sermons that got me really angry. Anyway, today we're going to look at how he groomed his audience to be sheep, more explicitly than you'd expect, and next time we're going to hear his thoughts on how and why this should be a Christian nation, and which political party needs to be defeated to make that happen. Hmm, big mystery there. As you can guess, this doesn't set up great conversations with people of different opinions. Now I don't mean to generalize about all evangelicals, and I caution you to still reflect on and control your own behavior. But if you've repeatedly found yourself in conversation with evangelicals who act belligerent to the point it's just plain bizarre, this sermon, and the reality that people like this guy are in the ears of America's Christians, might give you a chilling look into why. say good morning again. It's so good to be with all of you here and with all of those of you who are joining us online as well. It's Sunday, November 1, and uh, my goal with the message this morning is to help you to see and understand clearly what's happening in our nation. Now, as he tells his congregation he's going to help them clearly see and understand what's going on in our country, let's be abundantly clear about something from the start. He's just some dude sharing his opinion about politics. Now sure, he has the right to have and express that opinion, but the moment he gets on stage and insinuates he's going to offer his congregation anything more conclusive than that, and this with no qualifications other than his status as a member of his religion's clergy, he's greatly overselling his role in the conversation. And help you to understand what your responsibilities are as followers of Christ. In short, it's going to be your responsibility as a Christian to act on whatever conclusion he draws about politics. Whether or not you believe in God, your spidey senses better be tingling pretty hard at this point. And also to help you to make sure that you would possess a knowledge of the Word of God as it pertains to the current state of America. The Bible says jack shit about the current state of America. And any attempt he makes to apply its mess of varied teachings to current events would be so selective and subject to interpretation that whatever he as some dude says about it would be just as inconclusive as whatever he as some dude has to say about politics. I mean, sure, he's a pastor so he knows more about the Bible than he does about politics, low bar to clear, but a lot of sometimes even more qualified pastors and theologians conclude a lot of other conflicting things about the Bible. So it's pretty unlikely that some pastor what's his face at a local church is going to neatly conclude what the Word of God says about the state of America, and a lot more likely that instead, hazarding a guess, This is just a bald-faced attempt at putting the weight of biblical authority behind his existing political opinions. So I just want to pray before I begin. Uh, Lord Jesus, I just give you this time. And Father, um, I recognize that there are many times that you spoke to us um, hard truths and truths that at times went against um, our culture, that went against our traditions, our own opinions, and And yet, Father, uh, every truth given was given in love and was given to help us, Lord, as we walk out this journey uh, of life here on earth. And so, Lord Jesus, we just pray that our hearts and our minds would be open to hearing from you today. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we all know very well this. Prayer is directed at his congregation and not at God. Basically, he's prepping them for the fact that they might not like every opinion. Oops, I mean, hard truth he's about to share. And if they don't, it's not because they evaluated what he said and has good reason to object. Rather, this prayer heavily insinuates, it's because they didn't open their hearts and minds. And what do they need to have their hearts and minds open to? Hearing from you, meaning God, today. But seeing as this pastor is going to be the one doing all the talking, he's literally construing whatever he says as what God is saying. 
Sure, there's the pretext that God spoke to his heart and he's just relaying the message, but this is, let's just say, a convenient thing for him to suggest. Well, we have state and national elections in two days. Some of you have already voted, and some of you might be wondering, oh boy, why is he going there, okay? No, we know exactly why you're going there. And strap in, because this next part is going to be really creepy. If you thought I was exaggerating when I said he was grooming his congregation to be sheep, well, here's this. Why am I speaking about this? And the reason is because as your pastor, as the shepherd of this flock, that's one of the words for pastor in the scripture is shepherd, I am to provide to you two things. I'm to provide direction and I'm to provide protection. That's what a good shepherd does. He leads the flock uh, to green pastures. He leads the flock beside still waters. And also protection. He protects the flock from the wolf. If we can take one funny thing from this, it's that we all know at least a few members of this congregation walked out the door with no sense that this metaphor was weird and creepy and eventually called someone else a sheep for wearing a mask and getting vaccinated. But what's not funny is that this guy is telling a room full of grown adults that he's there to provide shepherd-like direction and protection to them, and it appears that most of them are sitting there acting like it's normal. I mean, sure, let's not deny that he might have a level of knowledge and life experience that might make some of what he says worthwhile, but so do a lot of other people in the room. And if you're one functional adult talking to other functional adults, you should be able to say what you need to say and let it stand on its own merits. The only reason you'd need to preface it by staking out your status as their shepherd is if you want to secure obedience without properly convincing them. If I ever tried telling you you should listen to me because I'm your shepherd or whatever, or otherwise insinuated you shouldn't critically consider everything I have to say and push back against me when I'm wrong, I hope you'd unsubscribe and encourage others to do the same. Because I'm a grown adult talking to other grown adults, not a parent talking to children and not a shepherd talking to sheep. And as grown adults, you have the right nay responsibility, to carefully evaluate what I say. This is especially true when you're about to go exercise your civic duty to make informed voting decisions. Oh, and if you're tempted to try comparing deference to a community of experts in an actual scientific field to obedience to a guy who calls himself your shepherd and just says stuff, maybe don't. And spiritually, I have no choice but to speak to you about what's happening in America today. But you do, though. In fact, the scripture that the Lord really pierced me with in, when I was considering this, because this wasn't a part of my calendar, my preaching calendar, was James 4.17, where God says, If anyone then knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, for him it is sin. I believe that God demands that I speak of these things. To not speak of it would be a sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really didn't want to tell everybody how to vote. Sure, but God told you to. Look, if something inside your head keeps telling you that you're sinning if you don't tell other people what to do and they're sinning if they don't listen to you, it might not be God. Maybe, maybe, it's just a part of your ego that feels like it's automatically right and experiences discomfort at being contradicted, so maybe telling yourself that it's God circumvents a healthy process of introspection on where your opinions, and your knee-jerk reactions to other opinions, come from, and sets you up for some pretty poor conflict resolution. Or to put it colloquially, it makes you act like an hole. So I just ask that you would have an open, tender heart. You know, if I say something that offends you, I want you to consider that perhaps I am speaking truth from the Word of God. And rather than shutting down or walking out, that you would, that you would just note it. Make a note to yourself, one word, two words, of where I offended you and be a, a man or woman of integrity enough to come to me and say, show me in the word of God. Show me, all right? Because people perish literally apart from God for eternity for refusing to love the truth. Notice how casually he suggests that disagreeing with him over politics introduces a danger of eternal torment. So if I say something that offends you, love the truth. Be a lover of the truth. And love it enough to say, I don't agree with that, but I'm going to have a talk to the pastor. Show me. Show me. Because the truth, because the truth matters. Decide. Choose in your mind and your heart that the truth matters to you. 
Okay, a couple things. One, what do you think the odds are you're getting an audience with this guy to complain about what he said in his sermon? And two, how much of a constructive two-way conversation do you think you're going to end up having with him? He pretty much makes the answer to these questions clear not only through everything he says and everything about him, but by how he describes what's causing the conflict. He's speaking the truth, and you're just offended. In fact, he manages to say so three times in under a minute. If I say something that offends you, make a note to yourself, one word, two words, of where I offended you. So if I say something that offends you... Go back and listen again if you want. That's the only way he characterizes a negative reaction people might have to him. So what kind of conversation is God's mouthpiece poised to have with offended people? I really doubt he's saying this because he intends to turn his office into a revolving door of open, healthy political debates. Rather, he's making people feel trapped by taking a very normal act, quietly going to church elsewhere if they think there's an irreconcilable difference of opinion at work here, and characterizing it as a lack of integrity, thus leaving them with no alternatives other than to sit in the pews nodding along, or try to get an appointment behind closed doors for a very uncomfortable and likely fruitless conversation with an authoritarian-minded religious leader who already has any difference between you and him cast as an attitude problem on your part. Oh, and let's remember most people aren't hearing this message in isolation. If you're sitting in his congregation, there's a good chance you have a spouse and children, not to mention a fairly large circle of friends, who heard him say all this stuff too. So if you just decide to leave, it will be with his words about integrity and not loving the truth still ringing in their ears. This puts you in a position of having to broach some pretty uncomfortable topics about someone you've taught your family to trust, or else quietly wonder how much they've been poisoned by his preemptive slander about your motivations. Of course, should you toughen up and take responsibility to have these conversations if you need to? Yes. And should you also take responsibility for the fact that you got sucked in and started trusting this guy to begin with? Of course. Trust me, I've been there myself. But he still bears responsibility for violating this trust and putting people who disagree with these opinions in this kind of uncomfortable situation. It's gross and shamelessly manipulative. So, what is America like today? 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 talked about America today 2,000 years ago. And God says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boastful proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. So basically the Bible said that in the last day, society will be terrible in the ways that everybody since the beginning of time has thought was unique to their generation. And this pastor, like how many people before him, fell for it. Or is hoping his congregation will fall for it. Now it's true that these are very dark times in America. And... As I've gotten older, you know, when I talk about talking to people who were younger, that in case, that, that's a broader, bigger group every year, right? Sure, that's how the math usually works out. But one of the things that age brings you is, is a perspective, because when I was younger and in the middle of certain things that were going on on a world stage, important things, I really didn't pay that much attention to them because my world was still really centered around kind of me and, you know, what I was doing and my classes and my work and, you know, trying to find somebody who would put up with me to marry me and, you know, all the things we get connected with. And, and, and so sometimes... In the middle of it, what's going on? We don't really have a clear picture. So literally, he wasn't interested in politics, and now he is. But I want to tell you that today there is a level of control, and this is by the national media and the social media, a level of control, a level of corruption, and a level of chaos with all of the writing that are beyond anything that this nation has ever seen. The, the actual embracing of what is false and what is wrong. 
This was a weird and very selective list of things wrong with our country. And what's this thing about a level of control by the national media we've never seen before? I mean, maybe I should forgive his lack of perspective in light of the fact that he by his own admission never paid attention to anything until recently, making you wonder why he's lecturing people about it. But while we used to get our news from like three TV networks and a handful of printed newspapers, now we have news sources out the wazoo, including cable channels I hope are far enough to the wingnut right for this guy, as well as practically infinite sources of online journalism of every level of and often complete lack of quality. So information is, by all appearances, way less under anybody's control right now than ever before. And why is the chaos of rioting just kind of tossed in there? I mean, we probably know why it was singled out while a tangled mess of other problems including police brutality and the massive uptick in emboldened white supremacy is ignored, and we can probably guess how, if he'd been preaching in the 1960s, he would have felt about the chaos caused by all the agitators back then. Now for the love of rhetorical and non-existent God, I'm not saying anything one way or the other about the equivalence between different protest movements. But there's something about his simplified reaction that would likely land him in a similar posture toward whatever minority protest movements happen to be taking place in his generation. Basically, this is the classic white evangelical response of focusing on the problems caused by protests while giving no thought whatsoever to the problems being protested. Of course, if there were a riot by other types of people, who, oh, just as an example, broke into a business and threw its merchandise into Boston Harbor, he might be more inclined to think about the underlying issues and not just the destruction. Who knows? It's a mystery, right? But the most obvious question, and the one that begs to be brought up since he's apparently so concerned about societal chaos, is the amount of hand-wringing he did by comparison the Sunday after an insurgency of people he probably more closely identifies with literally took over the Capitol and tried to overturn an election, which, you probably won't be surprised to hear, was literally zero hand-wringing. Seriously, I watched the whole thing just to find out and he didn't as much as mention it. Of course the rioters did more damage, but that's a measure of the extent of the riots at various places across the nation, not of the rightness of individuals' actions. I certainly wouldn't say it's worse than a coordinated, premeditated attack meant to undermine our democracy. I doubt this pastor really thinks so either, and you can only imagine what his entire January 10th sermon would have looked like if Trump had been elected and Black Lives Matter had taken over the Capitol to try overturning the results. Now I don't want to split hairs over comparisons, but it's pretty clear this isn't about a level-headed assessment of the complex web of problems our society is facing. By all appearances, his interest is in minimizing or overlooking the faults of one political party while zeroing in on the worst acts he can associate with the other one... Why? In two days, the American people are going to decide which direction we will turn as a country. Oh yeah, because he's prepping his congregation for an election. And this is a battle right now of biblical proportions. If this was thousands of years ago, this is one of those things that, that would have been recorded in the scripture because it's that big. What's happening in this nation right now, it's that big. Long ago, God promised that one day the heavenly bodies and the earth would be shaken. And that day, I believe, is, is upon us. Hebrews 12, 26 at a previous time, God's voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And I think that our nation has been shaken and that it continues to be shaken. 2020 has been quite a year. We, for the first time in history, 10 named hurricanes. To get a name, a hurricane has to be of a certain force and magnitude. For the first time in history, 10 named hurricanes touched ground in America, and the year isn't over yet. Wildfires have burned more than 4 million acres in California, more than twice the previous record. Colorado's also seen the largest fire in its history. Some areas in Michigan saw record flooding, while Phoenix set a new record with 144 days where the temperature reached over 100 degrees. Even though the year isn't over, we have already tied the United States record with 16 natural disasters with damages of over $1 billion each. It's sad when you see someone almost notice climate change, but then jump the rails and just say God's shaking the earth because of politics or whatever. The damage from the rioting is estimated to be $2 billion, with over 30 deaths, 
hundreds of inner injuries to innocent victims trying to navigate through the protesters, and over a thousand police officers have been injured. 143 have been killed this, thus far in the line of duty this year, a 30% increase in just one year. Okay, rioting is wrong. We get that, and I'm not trying to diminish the fact. But how about you not get on stage as a comfortable white dude doing fairly well for yourself and pretend that inner city minorities who have spent years being ground down by injustices and hardships they have basically no recourse against and that you've never had to even think about just started writing because they're bad and you somehow know you wouldn't end their shoes just because you're better? How about you not single out the riotous parts of a larger movement of protests and talk about them in isolation while turning a blind eye to the very deep and very real issues those protests were trying to address? How about you don't pretend there was no mutual escalation or history of ongoing brutality that fed into the rioting? Look, I'm not trying to excuse rioting or open up a Pandora's box of nitpicking or hair splitting in the comments. I also get that it's okay to bring up a single problem and that why don't you also talk about that is an annoying retort. But he's taking what looks like a deliberately one-dimensional and one-sided approach to some really complex problems by framing this entire movement and all the underlying issues in terms of the damage caused by the riots. And if we see him go on to frame everything as a conflict between purely good and purely evil people, which he'll do, sorry for the spoiler, this will look in hindsight like an attempt to poison the well by painting a lot of people and issues with an incredibly broad brush. See, America is being shaken. God said there will come a day when I will shake the world, and you and I, we're living to see the day. A lot of us were here for that big earthquake a couple of years ago. We felt intensely what it was to be shaken, but believe me, that was just the beginning. And I haven't even talked yet about COVID, which sent the whole world into hiding. COVID didn't send the world into hiding. It necessitated social distancing measures that people like you scoff at and do everything in your power to ignore, which is why the rest of us are still all dealing with a pandemic that there's a f***ing vaccine for. Sent the world into hiding is a hyperbolic word choice that, to put it mildly, doesn't exactly shed an intelligent light on a major public health crisis. For the first time in nearly 2,000 years, think of this, the first time in nearly 2,000 years, worshipers did not gather together to praise God on Easter Sunday. Yeah, a lot of people didn't gather to do a lot of things. I've canceled events, including various atheist gatherings, and spent months socializing almost exclusively over Zoom. It wasn't fun. And social distancing sucks for all of us, including non-Christians. So when Christians act like it was all about them, or worse, that it was just targeting them, they sound like the biggest, most petulant babies in the world, and they're showing a disgustingly self-absorbed lack of empathy for all the people who are going through the same things they are. I mean, that's just astounding when you think about that in the history of the church. And then we're not allowed to minister to the sick and dying as a pastor, as a believer. That's never happened before. It didn't happen in the Black Plague. Okay, hear me out. Maybe the fact that we today understand and react differently to disease than people in the Middle Ages did is a good thing. I don't know. Maybe. It never happened with smallpox. It never happened with the bubonic plague. It never happened with Ebola. It never happened with... Believers could always minister to the sick and dying. We're not allowed. What do you mean you're not allowed to minister to the sick and dying? What do you mean by ministering to the sick and dying anyway? This is a very vaguely described activity, and I'm curious which social distancing measures amount to you not being able to do it. Seriously, tell me exactly what specific form of care you're not allowed to offer people, and which rules are restricting you to what extent. Until he can do this, It's clear this is just one more example of him shamelessly dog-whistling to his congregation using insinuations that are so vague they're meaningless. People find ways to care for the sick and dying during a pandemic, and we all, not just churches believe it or not, have had to adjust how we do so while following guidance designed to protect both ourselves and those same sick and dying people from the spread of COVID. Sure, this can include the kind of personal care and comfort we might all offer those around us as needed, but it can also include actual medical assistance, which is a much bigger and more tangible responsibility, and the frontline doctors and nurses who have been pushed to the breaking point providing this care while bearing the responsibility for COVID safety measures would probably not find it cute when a rando like him with no medical qualifications whatsoever complains that he's not allowed to minister to people if he doesn't get to barge onto the scene and do whatever he wants, however he wants. And I want to tell you, Satan is laughing. 
He's laughing. And it's not simply what we've experienced with COVID and large-scale disasters and the unrest and rioting. So two days before an election, he's telling his congregation that the devil is laughing at them because of COVID restrictions and riots. It seems pretty clear what mentality this is meant to engender and what action it's meant to prompt. It's the culmination of a process in which he prepped his congregation for an election by setting himself up as someone who can speak inclusively on politics, insinuating that he's relaying the will of God, casting any disagreement with him as offense and possibly sin, making sweeping declarations about our nation's ills that all somehow align with issues that get the right riled up, and now saying that the devil is laughing at you because of it. In short, he frames this not as a situation in which a variety of people with a variety of opinions must tackle complex issues and find the best way to live together, but as one in which good people, you know, like the ones in our church, are fighting for righteousness against evil people, and we're equally aware of what they look and sound like, who align with Satan. This is how he'll go on to explicitly describe the current political landscape before telling you how to vote if you're going to be righteous. And we'll see that next time. But what we saw today is the laying of the foundation, which was setting up political questions as religious questions and him as the shepherd ready to dispense the answers on God's authority. Once you successfully frame the conversation on those terms, you're free to say basically anything free of healthy scrutiny. And boy, will he go on to take advantage of this freedom. This program was made possible by a grant from John Adams, Bob Generic, Maggie Danger, S.R. Foxley, A Little Logic, Daniel Bostet, Nidemos, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.